Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California, you're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hello, everybody. This is your host. Happy, uh, happy whatever day it is for you. Happy Tuesday. Sorry, that's right. This is Tuesday coming out to you. We um, are dealing with a lot right now. I'm, this is, the day that we're recording this is January 6th. So this is a bit unique because I always know that these are going to be bled out. But what has happened today has actually changed the kind of way that this episode was intended to go. But it actually fits really well with the subject that we're going to be speaking on. Uh, with that, let me first of all send a big thank you to the sponsor for this episode, Detroit artist Cass Dune, a.k.a. KB7 underscore art. For all your custom paintings, portraits, murals, and more, please feel free to reach out to him uh, via IG at KB7 underscore art or at 313-205-4735. We always appreciate any sponsor who comes in and uh, wants to support us, and uh, I hope that you'll check them out. So, um, okay. It's a delicate dance when it comes to speaking on society's issues. For me, I find way too many want to turn my conversation into a political one when I'm quite clearly speaking on uh, or to a humanitarian one uh, that doesn't justify or just benefit one side or the other, should I say, excuse me. And (laughs) I'm not talking politics. I'm talking old school right now, like just right and wrong. And I'm not trying to sound all flower child on you, but anything that would incite violence is clearly wrong you know we we have to can we agree on that like if it if it means like if you're wondering if i'm about if i'm about to be doing the wrong thing here's the answer yes if you are about to bring harm to someone or people who have no bone in your fight you are undeniably doing the wrong thing and i have this quote until we learn to care for each other as a species as humans first wars will be waged that needn't be children will die that shouldn't And people will suffer that never had to in the first place. I stand by those words. That's been my mantra for a very long time. And if you look at the back of my my most recent novel, Yugen, you'll see that that's my quote. I, I, I believe in that with all my heart and soul. But also being a person who's familiar and like kind of fascinated with human history, I know that we're very capable of messing shit up. We've done it before. We should be cognizant that we're very, very capable of doing it again. So we're treading down a slope right now that for everybody's benefit, I beg, I implore, I, I beseech you to please take a moment and like, we got to talk this out. We've got to get to a better place. And I'm not necessarily here to offer you all the solutions or, or necessarily the roadmap on how we get there, but I am telling you, we need to get there and we need to get there fast. Um, as a person, you know, I use every bit of my pl- platform to encourage people to be better being humble is not equivalent to being weak it is a strong person to stand in their truth whenever someone whether someone else accepts it or not what do i mean by that like when you know you're a good person and someone says you're a bad person well you can just be unaffected by that because you know it's not true you know you have power in standing in your truth and not being affected by somebody else's mentality so you know i say that hoping that you understand that humility, kindness, those things that make us good people are, are not bad and they don't make us weak. So when I talk about COVID on the show, you know, I'm definitely one of those people who will absolutely tell you it's nothing political to me. It is a public health issue, pure and simple. You may not agree, but if you believe in caring for your fellow, fellow brethren, then it should be very pretty easy to understand that public health is about people not getting sick or worse yet dying. And we should all be trying to make sure that that doesn't happen, right? For you, for me, for our families. When I've talked about police reform on the show, it wasn't because I don't appreciate the value that a good law enforcement officer brings to our communities. But you cannot deny that our system is so severely flawed that when people are treated humanely, inhumanely, I have a problem with that. And I want better. That's not politically driven, once again, that is humanitarian driven, so that your son can go out, so that my son can go out, so that we don't don't have to live with this fear of, you know, uh, targets on our backs. You also have a society of people who care about these issues and want to find ways to share their perspectives, and throughout history, it really has always been the the creatives capturing history. Think about it. 
In the caves, when they were drawing pictures, these were used by the tribal leaders to pass down the culture. This is how they told the story of humanity, the pyramids, da Vinci. Art has been our storyteller, capturing the essence of any time period, and the person holding the pen, paintbrush, or camera are in the driver's seat when it happens. Today, we're going to talk about the way that photography plays such a critical part in these social issues. And I'm very honored to be in a club of creatives who are keen on projects that benefit society and showcases all these that we're going through. And this man I'm about to introduce you to has definitely had his own experiences in doing so. And I'm very excited to introduce you to him. So without further ado, Josh Fogel is an LA born art center educated photographer, father, husband, and human. Photography has always been a passion, but it's part of his second act. Having worked for many years in television production, he eventually attended Art Center. His work spans street photography, portraiture, travel, and social commentary. Whether photographing models or some of the most well-known celebrities, creating beautiful images, or attending social justice protests, he does his part to share the fight the, through his images. He has traveled to seven or to Russia seven times to document an annual Bana Mitzvah event in the Russian Far East for the Joint Distribution Community, which is the leading Jewish humanitarian organization working in 70 countries to lift lives and strengthen communities. He donates his time and service to organizations such as St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis or MCHA Access here in LA and has spent time with the U.S. military as a civilian documenting life aboard a warship. Basically, he likes to keep his life and work diverse and challenging. Here to dis discuss with me on the topic of the crucial role of photography and how it is being used for social justice, please welcome Mr. Josh Fogel. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> happy to be here. So happy to have you. We missed our applause. I'm so sorry, but, oh. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, it's a heavy day today. It's no January doubt. 6th. Um, we were already coming into this conversation you know, and we'll get into that. But first of all, um, tell our audience, you know, a little bit about your background and as a photographer. And I mean, I, <laughs> I do, I have to bring this up and an engineer, you might have to do this. I'm going to have you tell your backstory, but you are so, there's a couple of things. You are so incredibly humble and modest because when I asked for your bio, you sent me nothing that you, you, well, you sent me your information, but you left out some parts that most people would brag about like you and I and we, we showed it in the intro you have in uh, photographed some of the most recognizable faces of our generation we have Mark Ruffalo Kim Kardashian uh, Wayne Brady just incredible for our, our visual audience you see six you know David Diggs these are you know in Hamilton which is, by the way very relevant right now sure. um, you know talk to us about your journey and how you started out and how you've arrived here and, and what that was like so, I, okay, so yeah. So uh, especially having given a little bit of the uh, conversation that you and I had b before this, even before I had sent those images about social justice, about the way that photography plays a role in communicating around, our, around the world and how it has for, for generations, um, the emotion, the empathy, the, 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 the drive for, for social justice movements, I, I didn't want to litter my portfolio with with things that feel very frivolent, especially on on a day like today. Right. Um, obviously, not knowing that today was going to become the day it's become. Right. Um, documenting life has always been important to me. I, photography. I've always loved photography. I've always, you know, tinkered with cameras, etc. Um, it didn't really become my life's work until I want to say probably. Uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, and really the catalyst to, to give more energy to it was I had this incredible opportunity. Um, I was going to be going to Russia for the first time. I was going to be going to China. Um, I was working, I had left television. I was working in an electronic store and I, I bought a, a good camera. What I thought was a good camera. I bought a Canon 30D with a kit lens, um, having no idea how to use this device, I just knew that I was going to be in interesting places and, and have the perspective, I, I guess, of the other and, and be able to document to come back this, this very cool experience. And I came back with, with a whole mess of 
terrible photographs. Now, content wise, like there were moments I, I was in the streets and in restaurants and meeting interesting people, but technically there was, there was, it was just a mess. I, I didn't know what the difference between aperture and, and, and ISO and shutter speed. Um, and so technically they were terrible and I felt really, really down on myself, but also really driven to kind of figure out what this, what this thing does, what this box does, and how to make the images that I wanted to make. And so I started kind of self-training myself. I bought books, I went on the internet, et cetera. Um, and things started to come together. I started to build a pretty good portfolio. Um, thanks to my older brother, I started shooting his band. Everyone in LA has a brother with a band. So I was spending a lot of nights down on Sunset shooting bands. Um, and that led to shooting Rihanna and and Usher and, and Three, Thievery Corporation, and Massive Attack. and and really kind of feeling like this is something that I should put more weight behind. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was going to put together a portfolio and apply to art center. And if I got in, I got in and that would be, that would be, I, I would move. That'd be the sign. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I dove in with both feet and went three years and uh, graduated with my, my BFA. And it has been my life since. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not really a comic book guy, but, but with great power, and I, I'm using that way out of context because, believe me, what I have is not a great power, um, but comes great responsibility. And so I found that if I could use my, um, my photography to communicate something more than just frivolous things, again, um, that I would do so. And so that meant going to marches. It meant loading my Instagram with images and context and content that I thought would inspire other people to either join into movements, et cetera. Um, it meant attaching myself to organizations like MCH Accents, which is, is very important to me. Um, and through that, it kind of brought me into a, a very interesting community of like-minded people. Um, and it brought me in contact with, with not like-minded people who felt that um, the things that I was promoting um, were not agendas that should be talked about, et cetera. But it brought upon some pretty interesting conversations nonetheless. I'm sure, I'm sure. And, you know, I gotta, I, I wanna take a step back because you are, you know, as I started off your intro, you are a, a father and a husband. And we do have the, the I'm, my engineer is gonna give me another picture, the one that we, the one with, so if you saw it and you're part of the visual, we have a photo of you in the hospital mm -hmm. with your wife and your child. Somebody took the photo from outside. Can you tell, can you, set this up for me you know we, we see the image you are standing what is that third or fourth floor in the hospital someone standing outside right so my um my wife and i had a baby in may i'm going to try not to get emotional about this Aww. um she was not a covid baby she was conceived way last year <laughs> um but she was a covid baby in the sense that uh this is kaiser sunset um where my my wife had um had our daughter iris and having having that experience was was very unique you know in our right. culture um, bringing a baby into the world is a very communal thing. We both come from very large families. Um, I come from a Jewish background, which has a very large family. My wife is Hispanic and she has a very large background. And there was no cigars in the waiting room. There was no, you know, announcing it's a girl. There were, there were none of those things. It was literally just the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the way it works is when, when you, you, you show up and, and we get separated immediately. We got to Kaiser probably like 11 o'clock, I believe, on Sunday night. And my wife goes upstairs and they test her for COVID and they get her situated in a room. And an hour later, someone comes down and gets me. And being apart for that hour was right. very stressful. Very stressful. Because I, I had a good understanding of what she was going to be going through or was feeling. Um, and so they bring you up and you're in the labor room and we were in the labor room for 22 hours and, and Rachel had Iris and then very quickly they kind of move you into a, a, a normal hospital room. Um, and then you're locked in. There's no going to the cafeteria. There's no anything. There's no leaving the room. Right. Um, and I had a camera with me and I was able to, you know, take the pictures that I wanted. Um, we have a friend of ours, uh, Rebecca, who's a, um, an amazing photographer as well, who lived not too far from there. She lived in the Hollywood area. And I asked her, I said, come to the hospital. I said, we're right across the street from, um, uh, from, uh, I can't think of what it is. Anyway, I t I'll tell you where we are. I'll describe this, where we are. Um, I want you to come at night. I want you to bring a long lens. Um, and she did and she took a whole series of beautiful portraits of the three of us from a distance right. as many of us have been, right. uh, during COVID. Um, and I, I love that photo. We have that as a print in our house. That's amazing. It, it speaks to what a lot of people have been 
going through right now and the adjustments and the sacrifices. Um, my grandson was born in January, January 22nd. So we literally missed, you know, I was able to be there. And right. so when friends subsequently would start telling me their experiences, like you said, it wasn't a COVID and in the way that it was, you know, your, your child was created. But yes, you, it's still you end up having this experience like that's not the traditional way that we have had children, sure. um, at least not since like the 50s when guys weren't really allowed in the labor room and stuff like that. Nowadays, you know, and I. I can only imagine for you, what do you think was like the biggest uh, challenge of that moment for you? I mean, I, so not that there's a silver lining, right? There's no silver lining to what's been going on. But I can say that having been home for two months before Rachel had the baby and it just being the two of us was a great bonding experience. Um, and then as a father, as a new dad, um, being able to be home every single day, morning, noon, at night, for the first four months of her life before right. I started going back to work was, I feel very grateful. Right. Like I am fully aware of my privilege. I am fully aware of the opportunities that um, have been afforded to us and to be able to be home, the three of us, every moment. Right. You know, before the baby was born, I thought, you know, I'll take two weeks off before the baby's born and maybe I'll take the month of June off right. and that'll be fine. Right. It, and it, it, wouldn't, it yeah. wouldn't have been fine. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that it, I do actually think, I mean, in everything, there's a silver, I do believe in silver linings, I think, given my background and tra trauma, and it's like you hold on to those. That's what resilient people do. Sure. You know, we look for the silver linings. And so I'm kind of moving into the conversation of like, again, going back to today. Why is this significant? We're actually probably going to push this episode up in release schedule to, to kind of float as closely as we can. But January 6th, we have experienced what we see is a coup you know what i mean people are calling it a coup because it is if you're attacking yeah. the capitol building and you don't you're not supposed to be there and your intent is to you know basically overthrow the democratic system in place mm -hmm. or reject it that is a coup well to disrupt and destroy exactly yeah. and i so you know so going back to kind of photography because i i want to say that i feel that throughout history you look at the civil rights movement these images, I wasn't there, but these images give me an idea of what other people experienced. And where social justice is concerned, it's like some people, I mean, I will say like for the creative community with regards to photography, whereas photography has been used to promote and create propaganda totally. to tell a false story. But there's just certain parts of photography where you can't, you're not faking it or you're capturing something that extends a fake narrative. For example, in my head, I mean, I can just instantly think of images of Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, you know, uh, children running naked towards photographers. Uh, my stepdad was a Vietnam vet and he was very tra traumatized by that experience. I was not allowed to light matches in the house because it smelled like sulfur, which smells like napalm. Mm -hmm. um, and he would tell us stories about how when children ran towards you, you would have to make a choice sometimes because you didn't know if they were strapped with a bomb you didn't know so it was them or us the gis the horrific things that he had to experience and so i say that to say when these photographers are there to capture it and so you've gone out there you've gone on warships you're trying to capture the real essence of what's going on you know how has how how when you put your your eye behind the, the lens what is it that you are seeking, knowing that you're here to document and you want to be as, um, like I said, not creating a narrative, but just capturing it? What has that been like for you? Is there anything that stands out to you? Well, I think that there's always a perspective, right? Like, mm -hmm. so the the camera is, is is a tool and I'm choosing my framing. I'm choosing my moment. So, so context is very important. And obviously in an image, there is lots of context. Now, whether or not that context translates to truth is like, super highly debatable right right I agree. um uh and it's interesting so you mentioned the the picture of, of the little girl running from the napalm mm -hmm. um, that nick Ut took mm -hmm. uh during the vietnam war and the picture that um i've met nick a couple of times and the picture that ran in i believe it was time or life time. Right. magazine right. is is actually cropped and what's interesting about it is if you see the full image there's another photographer on the side of the road trying to load film into his camera and so it's really about opportunity and and capturing, identifying, and anticipating moments. Right. Um, and there are definitely moments when you take an image and you're like, 
that's like I know I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I, even if it's digital, you know, I haven't checked, or if it's analog, obviously you haven't processed it. But every now and then you do have that feeling like you've captured something incredibly special, incredibly um, motivating, um, in incredibly emotional. And I mean, that's what you long for. Like right. you shoot and shoot and shoot and you you really try to, in there, there's there's something. Yeah, you make you remind me of one of our former guests, another amazing photographer, uh, Kim Fortino. She uh, was photo, she's a Niner. She works for the Niner. She's mm -hmm. their team photographer, sports photographer. And we talked about capturing the day Cap took a knee. You know, that first time she was photographing, and she's standing, and like she said, she says, you just knew in your spirit you were capturing something bigger than what was just happening right there. Um, when we, okay, so I feel that photographers have always kind of, they've been there to capture the social movement, the social causes. And when I speak to social causes, I'm really speaking to issues and, um, matters that negatively affect society like racism is negative right that's a social issue because racism is bad let's just be clear on that if anybody does not agree with me this might be the wrong show for you Agreed. racism bad right humanity good <laughs> or we want to try and be you know good but you know the impact of these images and the story that they tell it may not always be the whole story but they capture something undeniable like you said how as a professional like as a photographer you know as a professional in this industry um where like when you go out so you you do your photography in the studio right and then you go out you've gone to protest you've sure. gone out there in the field boots on the ground to capture images um what I mean, I, what role do you feel you're playing then in that sense, right? I mean, I know you're the photographer and like you said, but what role do you feel you're playing in in these efforts to create more awareness? So I think it's just that, like my role is a communicator. I'm there to document the things happening. I very rarely will manufacture images. It is about, you know, being a fly on the wall. Obviously there are opportunities for more, um, uh, more direct imagery like you stop and have conversations with people and then there's the opportunity to to make an honest portrait um etc but being in places that lots of people don't go being in moments that many people might feel they don't understand or that they might not have felt comfortable being in and being able to communicate what that experience was right is is really important um what, what's interesting about what you're asking about is had we not been in COVID during the the uh, BLM movement of the last uh, last year, there were definitely times when I was at home and I'd be holding my daughter and COVID is out there and people are getting sick. And I'm like, I would, I was so itching to be out there and be shoulder to shoulder and to be helping to, to tell the story and capture the images. And I had conversations with friends of mine um, who were out there, many of them extraordinarily talented African-American photographers and kind of the, the idea of allowing photographers to speak their story. It's not my story, right? I'm a, let's be honest. I'm a middle-aged Jewish kid, white from the Valley. Um, it's not my story. And so giving focus, you know, like, like, like the black box, right? The, the initial idea behind the black box, which I don't know if people feel like it was successful or not, I had one on my page, um, was about directing traffic to or away from good information. And so if I wasn't flooding the feeds with, with protest photos that I was taking, then I had the opportunity through my stories and through posts to direct people to photographers who were there, who really were telling their stories. Right. And so I felt like I was able to to have a part in the movement by promoting my my other community members in photography. Right, I feel like we're doing that same thing in this space, we're amplifying. We're sure. amplifying the voices that deserve to be heard, that need to be heard. Uh, you know, I, I get so tired of people saying, well, that's not my experience. Okay, mm. that's great, that's not your experience. Can you sit down for a moment and listen to this experience? Because just because you have an experience that does not 
invalidate another person's experience, right? And I think that when we talk, I mean, the whole, the BLM conversation, especially for people who are not black like us, you know, though I'm a woman of diversity and multicultural and I do understand. And I mean, even I would say like, like it can't be easy being a Jewish kid, like Jew Jewish kids get teased too sure. and, and, and sure. stereotyped against and all of that. And I mean, I, I, I want to say, though, I, before I forget, when we talk about going, you know, and, and I love that you wanted to, and we know that there's more than one way. I wanted to be out there as well, more than I was. Um, but my immune system being compromised and all those things, uh, the three kids I got to raise at home, yes, I, I wasn't able to get out. So I looked for other ways, like you said, to sure. promote. And sometimes for other people, if you if you feel you, you can't get out there, that doesn't mean you can't do something. But for the journalists that do get out there, is amongst your community of peers what are some of the risks what like so the so a black photographer goes to the blm uh, protest what are their experiences do are they are they in jeopardy are they in are do they get there knowing that i could be in harm's way but i'm going to be here anyway i think i think there's an inherent risk right like um without some very visual way of identifying yourself as a, I'll use air quotes, as a legitimate photographer. I mean, we live in a world where everyone has a camera. We right. saw that We saw that today in Washington. Right. right. We saw dozens of people with photographers. We even saw people wearing flak jackets and on the back it said press, which anybody can order on the internet, right. et cetera. So there's an inherent danger of getting swept into um into, into into a bad situation, but right. you would as a as a protester, you would as a photographer, you would as 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 a bystander. Um, uh, I know I've been in in L.A. Uh, you showed one of the photographs um, I took at the L.A. Public Library of an LAPD officer with his assault rifle. Um, they were clearing that park, and I was in that park, and my only identification was the fact that I had a camera in my hand and. Sometimes I'm good with my words. And so as I was able to avert being arrested. Okay, I'm going to have to do it. Do it. Do you think it was also because you're a white guy? 100%. Because when we Absolutely. look at what's happened today, like I'm going to tell you that's my biggest issue to, to, with today. Aside from the fact that it threatens our democracy, I think that uh, there's a lot of people. I have to read this. This is a message from my own daughter. I asked her if I could read it. My daughter is 23. My daughter is a mother. And she's young. She's, you know, I've definitely raised her being aware, but also trying to heart. You have a daughter, Iris. Mm -hmm. You're going to try your best to protect her from the ugliness of our world. And now that my daughter is older and she's, you know, a wife and mother and she's out there on her own having these experiences, she just, she just, she's getting a very, uh, a, a big learning lesson right now. And she sent me a message that I have to share. And I asked her if I could share it with the audience. So be careful, you know, with Iris, that's what you need to know. This is, might be her one day and hopefully not. That's, that's what I would like. But she said, I'm honestly so angry and embarrassed right now for this country. When there was a BLM protest in Santa Ana, I went with Angel, her husband, in support. And the riot police was there before anyone was there. And they did not, in caps, hesitate to shoot people with rubber bullets and throw can after can of tear gas. I was even trying to help a boy on the side of the street who was crying in pain from the tear gas. This is so blatantly showing how racist our country is and how Trumpies can do whatever the hell they want. I'm just so freaking pissed. And pardon for anybody's feathers getting ruffled, but that's my 23-year-old. She said she was almost crying when she wrote it to me. Because suddenly now as a mother, she's doing the same thing I've done oftentimes. What kind of world are we creating for our kids? Totally. And, you know, photographs are not merely reflections of reality, but mediated vision or mediated images that convey many meanings. Do you agree? I totally agree. And again, like like I said before, a photograph is a a frozen moment in a very specific perspective, right? The photographer aimed his camera in a very specific way and took that took that image. And what's not in the image are all the things that happened before it. And what's not in that image are all the things that happened afterwards. Sure, sure. And sometimes it doesn't matter. there's a picture I remember posting one time. It's of uh, Prince Harry from the side. And it looks like he's flipping people off. But then you see the front version. I think you've probably sure. seen this. And yeah. he's just holding three fingers up. He's not even like flipping anyone off. But it looks like it from the side. Totally. Context is really important. But it's so important to have because like what do you think it's like for any photographers right now at Capitol Hill? So I, I have friends who are there today. Um, and I, I feel like this went next level, obviously, 
right? Like we have not seen um, an assault on government uh, like we saw today. Right. And, and that is, and that is, that's nonpartisan. If you had, if this was any yes. group who, any group who responded the way that they did today, um, I would be horrified. Right. I would be embarrassed. Shame on them. A thousand exactly. percent. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. And, you know, and we have a perfect example because there have been, there have been protests in DC that were, um, prepared for in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we saw, the, again, the Black Lives Matter movement yeah. um, had protests in D.C. and the district and the government prepared for those um, protests and events in a very different way in terms of how having more of a militaristic response. Right. In June, when we saw protesters just standing there, you know, I was watching live real time when I saw the protesters move back so that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Trump could go out there and take his picture. And I'm with you. If it was any other any other group, you know, like, for example, I mean, let's just be honest, in 2000, what, 16, people were not happy that Trump won, but she, and you, yes, you had marches, but you didn't have what you had today. Nobody was storming Capitol Hill. If I was to turn on the TV and see that in Venezuela or somewhere, I wouldn't be surprised, but sure. we're seeing it in our country. And that's why so many people right now are like, wait a minute, this is not supposed to be happening. And, you know, part of why I'm saying that the photography is so critical in bringing, because I hear people are like, oh, I can show you videos or pictures of this, that, you know, and I'm like, well, I can show you pictures and videos of this. Right. Like we can all um, present our evidence. But and I think that's also kind of I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, that's no. kind of indicative of the world that we now live in is everything's on video. There's photos and video of virtually everything. Right. This conversation. Right. <laughs> um, and so. You would think that there's this. So there's this old notion of honesty through paranoia. Right. Mm -hmm. Where if. I, if I feel like there's an opportunity that someone's been watching, then maybe I won't behave in this way. And a lot of that has just gone away. Right. Right. I mean, a, aside from the lack of empathy in much of much of our world right now, like the idea that we're not actually responsible for each other, um, just the lawlessness. Right. Just the idea that nothing matters, that that my rage outweighs everything in my path sure. and there are there are people who have extraordinarily valid uh reasons to have their their rage they have historic reasons 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 to have their rage um but we haven't seen anything like we saw right today the sorry. yeah no 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 i mean i i and i well i gotta say i mean if if do you feel i mean photography i feel is there to create and develop empathy for people whose experiences differ from their own. Like that's, yep. that's the no, that can be the noble part of it. And when people start to let go of that, I think it just, it takes us down a very dangerous path. Um, if I, if I yeah. could. So, I mean, today's a perfect example, right? So all of us have been glued to our TVs and glued to our phones refreshing and scrolling through and watching live coverage and on Instagram and on Facebook, these photos of people sitting at Nancy Pelosi's desk, desk and leaving yes. her a note. Mm -hmm. With a manila um, folder, yes. Exactly. Um, and that's that's not a reporter in there with them. That's them putting the photos out. Right. Right? Like he wow. was posing that's... for yes. that photo. So that doesn't, we don't even live in a world anymore where you and I shouldn't say this, I'm talking myself out of a job, where you are required to have someone with any type of craft or skill or special equipment, et cetera. Like we all have it in our pocket. Right. Um, and we have those images. Now we also have ex very dramatic photos of people on the house floor and, and, and repelling from the, from the gallery. I mean, aside from the in insanity, like we have that because we have, you know, Getty photographers were there embedded in, in the Senate and in the house. Right. Right. Yeah. Cause they're always supposed to be there to be documenting history. Right. That's, that's their role. Um, how do viewers contribute to the construction of the meaning of a photo? Like, you know what I mean? Is it, well, I think that, I guess that's, that's a very heavy question and I think it's probably multifaceted, but I think that right now a lot of people's views contribute 
to their perceptions and the realities that you know they're creating based on these images but when you see when you see something like what we're seeing today it's just it should cause a lot more alarm sure you know i think um, i think perception is reality right mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. i am the sum total of my existence like of my experiences sorry um, so I, I bring with me everything that I have experienced, everything that I've seen, everything that I've heard, everything that I've been told, whether it's true or not, I bring all of that with me. Right. Um, and a photograph is something very different. So when, when you take a photo, for example, of something that happened at a protest, it's the viewer. I mean, I've obviously now with Instagram and Twitter, whatever, I have whatever, 120 characters yeah. to share. <laughs> right. Um, what this is a photo of but if i didn't have that then i'm relying on the viewer to bring their experience and their context to to the photo um but if done right you're telling a story and you're telling a narrative that i think helps the people along but i i don't want to tell them too much like i don't i'm I, i'm not taking photographs to try to convince anybody of anything it's really about Oh, that maybe that's not entirely true, but um, really, it's it's about invoking something in them. And if it is a political thing, or it, or it is a, an emotional, it's just a societal message that I'm trying to convey, that I'm trying to make a connection with them, and and hope to just to move the movement along towards a world that I would feel better about living in. Oh, that's exactly same thing here. I can only have conversations. People get what they get out of it. I'm hoping, I think like with a photograph, that's what I see. You, you place a photograph. For example, you can take a photograph of the same thing and, and look, show it to three people. They may all have different reactions, different emotions. Some may be sympathetic, empathetic. Some may say, oh, that's fake news. That's kind of one of the problems right now. Like my daughter was saying, you know, she sent something to a friend. They're like, oh, that's fake news. It's like, it's not fake news, it's you know, it's, it's, it's proof or it's like you said, a video or a recording. These are not fake. This is real. And, you know, one of the questions I want to ask you is what role do you feel that these images, these very powerful images and needed? And by the way, that's why I love um, creatives who want to take, you know, you're very specific. You do your job. I mean, yes, you photograph Kim Kardashian and these incredible, you know, I mean, I'm sure that there's, I, I love Larry Neymar, our, our, one of our former guests, one of my very good friends. He's the co-founder of E! And, you know, it's like people hear that name and they probably presume a certain thing, but you really go out of your way. You're not just about these type of images, though you're capturing them in an amazing essence, but you go out there and you use that craft and that capability to really communicate something. I feel it reveals injustices. I feel that it reveals, um, you know, information that hopefully will encourage people to take action against social injustice. Do you feel that power? Do you feel that influence when you're going into these, uh, situations i mean I, like, I feel like that's the point right i feel like that's like i'm not going out there and shooting uh you know still lives or, or or whatever if i'm going to a protest and i'm going there purposefully um and I've, I've been at protests that i believe in solely with my heart and i and i march along with the crowds and while i'm doing that i make images but i also go to protests for things that i think are ridiculous in an attempt to I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to use the word mock, but but in a way to also share that that experience, um, because I think understanding other people's perspectives on issues is also incredibly important. Like like I said, Absolutely. I think empathy is one of the things that we have really lost sight of, and I, and I you know most people don't know the difference between empathy and sympathy, right. um, but I think that the the distinction is is excruciatingly important, and I think one of the things that we've been experiencing over the last, you know, handful of years is a lack of that is your life and your needs are just not important. Your, your wants or your feelings that you should have all of the things that I have are ill founded and just not important. Right. Right. What do you, with regards to creatives? So, you know, you're very passionate, you're very vocal. You let people know, yes, I'm a photographer and I do all these different types, but I stand for something. That's kind of been my thing. Stand for something or stand for nothing. You know, sure. like, uh, let, let's see where you are. There's another reason why I love Hamilton, the, the, the you know, Lin-Manuel's production, because everything about that, um, which is ironic, because if you take Hamilton, it's so powerful, but 
and this is the other thing like there's people again i think i said this earlier there's people that climb those steps today they think they're on the right side of history they think they're the good people and i'm not calling you bad but there has been so much misinformation there has been so much um intentional negativity sown we need unity we need healing we need people that are going to remind us like you said we've come come so far away i, I always have to say this like facebook is interesting because i grew up in a generation i mean i'm 45 so i grew up like you didn't just walk up to a circle of people and start contributing to a conversation you were not involved in you you were spoken to or you spoke when you were spoken to right i mean that's right. just the way that i was raised sure and unless you're in a bar is... if you're in a bar and you hear a conversation you interject but even that like i mean i, I wasn't in bars a lot of <laughs> you know i have to talk about, like it was just it was ingrained in me i'm mean, probably also because i'm a female so i was told mm -hmm. don't talk politics outside don't talk religion in circles of society um which i've broken those rules a lot since as i grew up and uh but what do you, you you're in this group of creative individuals who not just want to do the pretty stuff you want to do the important stuff um what do you say to other creatives like yourself that maybe struggle maybe they just right now they're like oh i gotta stay you know maybe more commercial sure what do you say to those who are considering and what are the risks and the advantages of really saying i'm gonna step out here and i'm gonna i'm gonna capture these images and i'm going to have a focus where it's not just the pretty things but it is social issues and conversation or thing that contribute to those conversations so i think it has to become an extension of yourself right i know that there you, you were talking about um you know you don't, you're not looking to ruffle any feathers i well i understand that if someone doesn't want to hire me because i've participated in a, in a protest or because i contribute to an organization that they don't believe in and they don't want to hire me that's just the Peace. way of the world. Exactly. <laughs> God yeah. bless you. Exactly. Exactly. Good luck Thanks. to you. Um, I don't want to be associated with, pe with people like that anyway. Um, social media is a construct, right? So social media is very highly curated. Um, for example, I've, I've never shown a photo of my daughter on social media. It's a right. choice my wife and I made. And whether we change that at some point, I don't right. know. But for right now, it's just not something we do. And I have people messaging me like, is everything okay? Right. Is everything okay with her? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. why? And like, well, you know, some people have an entire Instagram dedicated to their dog or their baby. <laughs> and I'm like, that's great. I choose to only be so personal in my social life right. and in my social media, rather social life is very different. Um, but it, it, it is a construct in that I share with the world what I choose to share with the world. And if my, for the most part, my Instagram uh, is, is business driven. Like it's the, it's the medium that I, that I use probably most to try to parlay some work into, into new work. Right. But I feel like people are gravitated more towards pages where they feel some sense of personality right. and some humanity. I try to keep that in my stories. There's not a lot of personal stuff in the, in my posts, right. uh, or if it is, there has to be some photographic merit to it. Uh, unless you scroll all the way back, which I should probably delete a lot of. Um, but but it's a choice, right? It's a choice to air my grievances. It's a choice to air my political, um, my political views in, in that social media thing. And I've had people message me. It's like, yeah, you, you know, you probably shouldn't blah, blah, blah. The, someone might, and I'm like, I, why should I care? Right. Like if I wouldn't want that person in my personal life, then why should I care about offending them in a professional way? Right. Right. I well, guess. especially if they're just mad at you for speaking up for something that you're passionate about, you know? Sure. And, and. I say that that we are acknowledging there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed in our community. That's everything that this is predicated on. You know, admit the issues that we are facing. Right. Ask the questions that hopefully get us to solutions, not just complaining about them, but actually really truly move trying towards positivity and forward motion that benefits us all, in my opinion, as it should, and then and then adjust our behavior. Right. And right. like, I feel that with photography and what it's provided for us, it's, you know, like I said in my intro, going back to cave days, it provided an idea of what people lived through, lived with, what they thought, what their morals, what their ethics were. And photography is another medium that just brings so much value to that, to the way that that works. Right. It's, it's, it's a shared, it can be a shared experience. 
um, either in a, a communal way, like two people who have had separate experience, separate experiences in the same way, and then they see an image and, and realize that they can have a conversation about it, mm -hmm. or it's about opening people's eyes to something they've never seen. Like, if, like I said, if we hadn't seen photos and videos of what was happening today, and we were just to read about it tomorrow in the newspaper without any image images, it would have a very different effect on us emotionally. Right. Agreed. 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 Because like I said, when I was watching that in June, I'm just I couldn't believe it was I was happening in front of my eyes. I'm like, wait, what is this really happening? Sure. What do you what's your personal call to action for others in your industry and future hopefuls? Yeesh. Um, <laughs> um, I just love to let them look at those complicated <laughs> questions. Um, I would just say this is it's it's just necessary, right? Like imagery are everything we experience nowadays is driven by by imagery advertising is image is driven by imagery social media um is we are inundated by images um for better or for worse right like so i do feel like imagery and photography has become much more democratic um yes. in our world in that in terms of access mm -hmm. but th there have been stages to that right like mm -hmm. so um you know at one point photography was extremely complicated and dangerous and expensive and so only certain people did it so you only saw images that those people took and then you know eventually kodak came out with the brownie and, and there's been this this evolution. evolution right right um but now uh i mean billions of images are, are taken every single day i think right. like don't quote me on that but it sounds, no, I, sounds right yeah it sounds right <laughs> uh, i mean i take half of those just of <laughs> of my kid um but i think it's important and i think that it's important I think the democracy of, of photography is important in that um, the more voices that are heard in a conversation, I feel like can be really important, especially when those voices are coming from, you know, places like Bahrain and, and, and places where there isn't a ton of um, access. Op access or a ton of non-government regulated media. Right. Um, you know, some guy with a with a flip phone is able to take a video of something that on this side of the world we have very little idea of what it's like to to be experiencing. And today's actually a pretty good example. Like what happened today is not something that we haven't seen happen in other countries. Right. The difference is we're not used to that having happening here. And right. COVID is actually another great example. It's not something that we are used to hap happening in our house. Right. It's something that we donate to charities so that they can go fix or help somewhere else. Right. Um, right. And I just think that we're ill prepared for it. Yes. And I agree. And, you know, it, like I just, oh man, it's too, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with, but I remain hopeful. I remain um, thankful for the people who step out and are bold enough and in, challenge saying you know and and that they are there to capture it it's not it's not uncommon for photographers to risk their lives yeah. to get people an inside perspective or a view whether it's you know it's it may be just one but it is a view nonetheless and when it comes to things like war and tragedy and trauma those images they're, they're warnings to us. They're an idea of what we don't want to experience here. And I mean, I just, I really applaud all that you do in an effort to um, be part of that and be part of history and, and on the right side of history. Because you know what? Yes, all eyes are on us right now. All eyes are on us. What are we going to do? And, um, you know, my big thing is that violence is just definitely not the answer. And I say that for self-preservation <laughs> and, and preservation of our society. So, you know, but there are there, you know, this is there's so much in this. I, I appreciate you coming and taking the time and having this conversation with me because it is it is important. Um, I hope that you continue doing lots of incredible work. I know that you are one of the very highly sodded after photographers. I can't wait to actually, you're, he's doing my book, my next book cover guys. And I just, I got to lose wait. some of the COVID weight first <laughs> and then I have to, and then we'll take it. But I mean, I, and then also my Ange wants to be here and we have to get her to fly out from Texas. And she's like, she's like, you can't have the shoot with, with Josh and me not be there. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> so we got to wait till you can get on a plane. But, um, 
But thank you. For our listening audience, can you please tell them where they can find you? Because there is another Josh Fogel photographer out there, ladies and gentlemen. That's not this one. This one is the L.A. based, not New York. That's right. But um, like I said, just look up Kim Kardashian and some of these incredible names. You see his name attached. Where can they get your services or inquire or even just support you? I, I would say probably just the easiest way is through Instagram, uh, Josh underscore Fogel. I think it's up on the screen. That's like, you know, it's interesting. That has become like the, that's the spot. When right. someone say, here's, oh, you're a photographer, you're a musician, you're whatever. Oh, what's your Instagram? I don't even know why I have a website anymore. And it right. hasn't been updated in a very long time. Yeah. But your um, website is joshfogel.com just in case. But yes, yeah. joshfogel.com is the website. Um, Josh underscore Fogel is uh, my Instagram. I'm I'm so pleased I was able to uh, be here. I know we've been talking about your shoot for I know. almost Since a year. Thumbs and bears. I was like, I, yeah. I just want you to know I'm not flaky like that. I'm not a Craigslist <laughs> type of person. Like, yeah, we're going to do it and then never show up. Right. <laughs> but uh, COVID has definitely added extra layers to that. And I just, I, I think you have such, done such amazing work. I encourage everyone to go and check you out. And thank you so, so much. I You're so kind. It. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us for another episode. Again, a big thank you to our sponsor, Detroit artist Cass Baydoun, uh, a.k.a. KB7 underscore art for all your custom original paintings, portraits, murals, and more at 313-205-4735. We so appreciate you. And I know that sometimes these conversations, they're actually difficult for me to have, by the way. It's its just because I, I kind of want to reach through and, and make everyone be better. Like I want to read through, reach through and, and create progress. And sometimes uh, you can feel quite helpless, but we're not helpless. We are here. And when we lift our voices together, hopefully we can create change. So with that, everyone, I hope you have an amazing day. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, thank you so much for letting us be unsugarcoated. Take care. We'll see you. Bye. Come back next week.